for tuning into yet another episode in which I talk about issues related to public transport, or in this case, any transport. So this is kind of an extended rant that I heard um, a couple of years ago, I think it was 2017, from my colleague, from, from my co colleague at the Marin Institute, uh, co-co-lead of the transit and land use, the Transportation Land Use Program slash Transit Cost Project, Eric Goldwyn. Um, in that we were talking about, so this was, um, the context was we were talking about dockless bike share. Uh, and Eric pointed something out that I think on hindsight is very prescient. Um, prescient, prescient, weird language, whatever. Um, about how transportation at scale, like, like mass, like big changes in transportation, um, always are bundled uh with their own infrastructure um so 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 what does this mean so this means um let me just what's my twitch account again sorry this is me telling you i forgot this okay so for example railways right railways have their own infrastructure railways have i mean the infrastructure in this case is the railway um but that's also um but, but that's also for other kinds of transportation i don't know i i, I mean I, I forget where the reaction is the word revolutions when we discussed this in 2017 2018 but it's um so so trains change the way people travel um the two most important transportation inventions i don't know if to say if ever because ever might mean things like the wheel um, or when people first invented the sailboat, but the, the two most important transportation innovations in, let's say, the last 200 plus years, I think they are the train and the car. Um, and if you ask me to name a third one, it would be, I don't know if to, if to say the steamship, um, um, but certainly would not, it would be ahead of the time. And, uh, and then the number four would be different, I think. So the, and the point is that so ships obviously don't have their own right of way, but they do have their own infrastructure. Everything comes with its own infrastructure dedicated to the new mode. So again, with trains, it's the easiest to see because trains are uh, a vertically integrated corporation. They can be private corporations and quite a lot of, what, of the corporate world as we know it comes from railways, com comes from early railways and how they had to scale up um, in, in, a, in a world where, yeah, there were, in the 1830s in the United Kingdom, there were big factories. There were managers who had hundreds of employees, but they didn't have corporate as we know it. Um, like the, the concept of middle management, for example, didn't really didn't exist at the time. It took decades to, to get there. Uh, and, um, and so the, uh, and, and so with trains, there's this integration between the the transport operations and the infrastructure and um, but that's true for for other modes that have less integration they still rely on dedicated infrastructure so so you've given you the, these four big inventions right the uh train the car the plane and the i'm not sure where the motorized vessel is a correct term for things it also includes steamships but the the boat that is the, the ship that is powered by something other than just sails or four stars, uh, and so for the ship, it has to be. It means uh, dedicated ports and docks, um, and these ports and docks have their own cities uh, attached to them. Usually, um, especially if they were nineteenth, early twentieth century. In the more modern era in developed countries, often you can have a big port that is not as urban. So in the United States, um, the biggest ports for intermodal traffic um, are LA and Long Beach, and then it's New York. Uh, but for bulk traffic, it's uh, uh, for its, uh, I think export, it's, um, I don't actually remember if it's mostly an export or an import port or for, co uh, or for coastal navigation, but it's, um, but it's South Louisiana. Um, which is between New Orleans and Baton Rouge, so not actually particularly urban. But of course, New Orleans became the largest city in the South as the port 
from which cotton produced by slave labor was exported. Um, so that was dedicated infrastructure. The port, I mean, it was, you don't just dock at some natural site. There have to be very extensive improvements in this. Uh, I mean, self-propelled, I mean, ores are also a kind of self propellant um, And wind power, in theory, means you're self-propelled as well. Um, it just so happens that wind power does not have the energy density required for a modern for a modern ship. And um, but but anyway, so this means so a lot of improvements had to be done, and these were incremental. So with with trains, it wasn't an, it, with trains it wasn't really incremental. It was you just you plop uh, two steel. I think originally it was iron, not and only there was steel, but you put, you you plop two iron rails um uh, 1.435 meters apart in um, inner end to inner end between manchester and liverpool um and you do and then you do it and then you do it again because you need double track um with early lack of telegraph and with expect high expected traffic um and you run trains and i mean yeah the technology had evolved from things like mining railways but as transportation it was actually rather revolutionary and maybe the and, and with steamships it was not as revolutionary it took i mean it, it took time and it started with things like steam paddle wheels and then uh, and before they switched to screws and um there were things like steam ferries before there were uh, ocean going ships by steam and um and and then there were i think there were there were there were sailing ships into the second half of the 19th century things like clippers um so, so for, for people who are interested in weird things, this ship, uh, the Mary Celeste, uh, was uh, a sail was a sailing ship, uh, and uh, the final voyage of the Mary Celeste happened uh, in eighteen seventy two. Um, so even after so decades into the steam revolution, this is. Uh, at this point, the, civil, the American Civil War has been over seven years. So uh, by this point, it's clear that the future of naval warfare, for example, is going to be exclusively by steam. Uh, and, and, the, and shipping is done at this point by steam, but there were still uh, sail. Um, so, so it was more gradual. And... Yeah, yeah, it, it was... I think, I think the... I don't actually know if the first railway in Britain was pure iron or iron and wood. I know that in the, in the United States, I know that in the Civil War, the South was iron and wood and the North was steel. But I don't know whether the South was using a form that had existed in the 1830s um, or whether it was always less advanced. Um, the, the, the railway network in the American South um, on the eve of and during the Civil War was less advanced in that of let's say England in the 1840s. Um, so um, anyway, the uh, um, and, and so with with the big so steamboats me meant for example the boats were bigger. It meant that it meant not meant it meant that uh, the routes were different because it didn't really matter sailing good wind. One of the the, the thing I believe that. Um, Terminally killed the sailing boat, um, the sailing ship. I don't say sailing boat that usually connotes some kind of pleasure, and I mean for commercial purposes, um, was the Suez Canal because you can't actually transit the Suez Canal um, under sail because you can't tack. Uh, so, you, so you have to be. Um, I don't know what to say. Internally propelled, like propelled without needing good wind, uh, and um, so. Again, infrastructure like the Suez Canal, the Panama Canal, um, investment in truly massive ports, which became uh, important cities. Um, so I'm hovering over the United Kingdom for some reason because I'm thinking of Liverpool, but Liverpool, first of all, was already one of the three main second cities of not just England, but I think all of Britain by the early 19th century. But let's look at not Britain, this thing, this new york city um it exists the way it does because of advancements in shipping um 
it's so the more shipping the uh, so new york new york's killer location is not the erie canal new york was already um on its way to becoming the largest american urban area um beforehand uh the new york's killer app was the was that it is the best location on the east coast of north america um for uh connections to europe because the other harbors uh, let's say boston boston is better is actually a better connection to europe but it is a terrible connection to the rest of north america it's too far north and the charles is small philadelphia you have to go up this river not the river i guess the the bay uh baltimore you have to go up this bay which is okay it's fine if you're exporting cotton or something but it's not the best uh washington same thing and even more annoying new york is actually really good it's a good protected location but right next to the ocean so the more shipping there is between north america and europe the more the main interface point between them which is new york city grows um so it changed so it, it meant new cities and we, again i'm talking about new york but for example the other uh place that i uh have lived more than five years in singapore um is also exactly like that um singapore exists essentially just because it has a good location relative to shipping um through the straits of malacca um and so there's uh so again new cities um extensive port facilities um actually i'm not going to show you new york i'm going to show you rotterdam just because in rotterdam i can point these out to you more efficiently um and i can also show you how this relates to changes in the technology uh, yeah there was an early railway out of charleston the long for a brief moment the longest railway in the united states was between was the south carolina one, or, uh, connecting to charleston i'm forgetting what its inland connection was i think was it was it um augusta or something like that um and yeah the uh confederacy yeah. Yeah, in theory, you could do it by horses. I mean, to this day, you have slug locomotives through the Panama Canal, but um, it's just much more efficient not to need that. Wilmington, Wilmington, um, what, what are Wilmington? Um, Wilmington is, again, still, the canal's not that good. So anyway, with Rotterdam, so this is not 19th century, this is 20th century. So the first thing you might, um, you should note is that, is how massive this complex is, this was in the early, at the very beginning of the 21st century, this was near target with Singapore for the largest port in the world. Since then, Shanghai um, has careened past both, and I think there are several others in China that have also careened past both. Uh, so just look at how much, like essentially everything between city center and, all, and, the, and the sea is port facilities. All of that needed to be built. Um, so, I don't actually know the history of the port of Rotterdam to tell you whether it was built mostly privately or mostly publicly or mostly publicly or a mix or different in different areas, but it doesn't really matter. It's massive infrastructure. The other thing that you should uh, notice is that it's all down river. Um, one of the changes in infrastructure is that uh, uh, advances in shipping uh, have meant steadily uh, larger ships. Larger ships don't go as uh, far up river and this meant that um there uh that ports had to migrate down river so we see this very clearly with rotterdam uh this is something you can also see um i think in antwerp um it's the same thing where uh the port facilities which even at this kind of low resolution uh you can uh you can kind of see the things oh and now we're seeing the railways so uh uh, the this is all between this is all downriver um, of city center. Um, London is the same actually. So London, uh, so in London it's been the same in multiple stages. Um, the boats could not cross the uh, London Bridge, so everything had to be downstream of London Bridge. Uh, and so there was their division into this is the origin also of the division between East London and South London. Uh, and uh, there, there were port facilities all over both sides. Uh, Canary Wharf was the West India docks, for example. So extensive docks built down river of the city. Um, 
as boat as ships got bigger uh, and over time they got so big that even this was no longer a good enough location so um, the port of London's main facilities are at this point way far down the estuary um, it's in places like here uh, and um, so, so this is substantial changes in infrastructure a lot of construction of new infrastructure to accommodate ships and to be very clear ships don't require infrastructure once they're in the water they require water I mean, okay, there's the Suez Canal, there's the Panama Canal, but for stuff like Europe and North America, the ocean is not infrastructure. And yet, extensive infrastructure had to be built. Um, what else? Planes have airports. Uh, yes, early planes could take off from grassy fields, but it was just not very efficient. So they had to accommodate airports. Um, and airports themselves had to be sized for growing uh, airplane traffic and uh, the planes got bigger until the uh, jumbo jet and then the super jumbo to the point that um, some airports had to be retrofitted to have some uh, terminals or some jetways that could accommodate the 380. Um, airplanes like railways and like steamships created some of their own uh, changes to infrastructure and in that um, you cannot put the airport in the middle of the city. You can put an airport, you can have airports that are rather close to city center. For example, um, uh, Tegel was just outside, it was, that location still exists, it's just no longer an airport, it's just outside the ring. Tempelhof was in the ring. It was not very efficient for um, um, the air travel even of the 1940s, so mid Berlin airlift, they opened Tegel. Uh, but this was kind of viable and was still used by aviation by, by very low levels of aviation until the 2000s um but as airplanes got bigger and air traffic got bigger they needed to move to places farther out so br ended up being built um out of Schönfeld, not out of Tegel. um and likewise in uh for example tokyo they built Mar they, they built narita they didn't just upgrade Haneda. um and um, so, the, and this also leads to uh, a lot of suburbanization of jobs because the uh, airport maybe attracts its own jobs the, um, that maybe like the location for international conferences. Um, I, uh, I've never actually done it, but I have heard of conferences that are entirely on the grounds of O'Hare Airport just because it's a very good location for uh, uh, internal flights within the United States and also for some international. Um, to the point that there were, I think, math conferences that were um, at the hotel or at one of the hotels of O'Hare Airport, um, just because it was really easy to get to. Uh, and this is also, and this is also why um, why Vegas is such a good location for conferences. It has so so much conference space um, because it's such a big tourism city. There's already a lot of. Uh, it started out as a tourism city. It started out as a casino. Uh, it started out as casinos. Um, so that led to a lot of air traffic uh, to, to Las Vegas, a lot of O&D air traffic to Vegas. Um, I can try Googling this, but it will be a forum. It'll not be the best location. But um, I think, uh, but at least maybe 10 years ago, um, Vegas was the number two busiest airport in the United States for either O and D traffic or domestic O and D traffic um, after LAX. Um, as an urban air, I actually I have the numbers for you for urban airspace much better. Um, and there, yeah, New York is of course number one. Just New York has three airports. Um, I think Vegas is number seven or something. I think it was New York, LA, San Francisco, DC. No, I think it was New York, LA, Chicago, San Francisco, DC, Boston, Vegas. Um, and then maybe Orlando. Um, and so Vegas because there's so much air traffic there also started becoming a good location for conferences and of course the hotels uh liked offering um space for um conferences for cheap because they were making their money on gambling uh there are stories that i don't actually know to what extent they're true but there are stories that um the hotels refuse conferences to groups that they don't think will gamble much so there are stories about how um uh maybe there was a uh, Maybe economists had a conference in Vegas attracted by the cheap 
uh, rates and then they were never invited again or maybe physicists or mathematicians. I don't know if it was all three or two out of three or an urban legend that was repeated for different fields that think of themselves as mathematically um, adept. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Um, and yeah, and, and, and then uh, you and uh, often airports uh, are, um, would be built uh, uh, in new locations, and, and these can also induce edge city development. So uh, in Bangkok, for example, the uh, uh, the the growing air traffic uh, meant that Don Wang could no longer support this, so they built Suvarnabhumi, um, and. While building Savarnabhumi, they also built a lot of related edge city infrastructure just because airports um, often induce their own edge cities. There's a lot of um, job sprawl, for example, near um, Charles de Gaulle. Um, it's very common for an airline that uses an airport as a fortress hub to be headquartered near the airport rather than the downtown of the same city. Um, so Air France is, I believe, headquartered very close to or maybe on the grounds of Charles de Gaulle. Uh, I think Air, um, Airbus, I think, is also, it's uh, headquartered near the Toulouse airport because that's also where they build the airplanes. And so um, so this is how airports are, this kind of infrastructure. And this can be either, again, it's, I think at this point it's mostly um, publicly built. Um, often, uh, often you will have an airline that um, coerces local governments into spending money for it on the uh, uh, threatening to move away, but sometimes it's just something that governments want to do to improve their access to the rest of the world by air. Um, what else is there? So in addition to these, then, the, the, then there are cars. And the thing is that cars kind of break people's brains when they talk about other modes of travel because cars, more so than any other mode of travel, um, make this relation between transportation and infrastructure look the least visible. So what I mean is that obviously the freeway is a very visible piece of infrastructure. Um, car domination predates the freeway. Um, now technically there were toll, there were limited access tollways from the very early days of um, cars. There was one called the Long Island, I think it was called the Long Island Motor Parkway or something like that. And I'm gonna actually check this. Uh, Long Island Motor Parkway, I think open 190 something, 1908. Uh, and uh, you may be able to tell from the brief moment that I was uh, on Google and not on Wikipedia that the route isn't even really used by uh, cars anymore because it was built for the cars of 1908. Um, in fact, okay, uh, it closed in 1938, parts of it survived, used a section of other roadways or as a bicycle trail. Um, but this is not, this is not, this is not even a freeway, I don't, I mean, I mean, maybe it was just because it was private, but it, it is not what we think of today when you think about freeways, even when we think about, uh, even when there's a, uh, detour or some work done on one tunnel, so they reduce the freeway to one lane in each direction, which sometimes happens in, let's say, Italy. Um, that's still different. Um, but even, so again, with stuff that doesn't really, like this is not why cars over uh, became the dominant form of transportation. Rather, it's that cars had the ability to take roads that had already been built and dominate them. Um, so there was extensive new construction. This needs to be emphasized. There was extensive new construction. Practically all of it was public. Um, none of it was um, directed top-down. There was top-down assistance. So road construction in the United States was an atypical example of a federal government that was very active. And even then, it was working with states on this um, and with local governments because, first of all, cars were, from the beginning, used by the elite. This is also true of planes. Um, trains are very different. Um, ships are also very different. They were mostly for uh, commercial traffic. And by commercial, I mean uh, freight. I don't mean passengers. Um, passengers would take ships, I mean, I mean as a cross-section, first, second, and third class. 
uh, and uh, the and, and and steerage would actually be you know actually poor workers uh, you know Ellis Island and Ellis Island and such it's not it's not like people flying economy class um, on airplane who are poorer than people who fly business but it's, are still much richer than John Pop uh, and so this meant that uh, and also the level of coordination required early on was not very large but there still needed to be infrastructure they needed to pave the roads um there, there was an entire movement about this in the united states a kind of proto new right maybe 60 years or 70 years before there was the actual new right called the good roads movement um which started out as something called the league of american wheelers it was about bicycles and as soon as um cars became a thing around 1900 um in the, I, I forget whether LAW change into or was eclipsed by the American Automobile Association, aka the AAA. Um, it began as a lobbying group for expanding roads. So that meant paving roads. It meant between cities, uh, widening roads, which had previously been basically walking trails um, or, or horse cart trails. Uh, it meant, uh, so there was a lot of this construction. Very early on, it was done by local magnates for their own use um so this is why it kind of obscures how much uh infrastructure was built and appropriated for this and of course because cars were other than the street cars which could only go at a certain frequency and on certain streets the cars could go on every street uh and they were the dominant users they were they were the uh fastest and heaviest user um other than trucks, which needed the same infrastructure. And in places that um, have a rule of force, um, the strongest vehicle wins. Um, and so, and, and maybe, and a lot of early rule of the road, things like the invention of jaywalking in the, as a crime in the 1920s, was essentially codification of this rule of force. Instead of, uh, instead of what happens in a lot of third world countries today, where, um, you can jaywalk whenever you want, but yeah, a car can could run you over. Good luck trying to get justice. It doesn't matter if the driver saw you. You move away. The driver is um, bigger than you. And of course, if you're a car driver, you still need to uh, yield to the truck. One of the things that actually... Uh, um, yeah, r um, okay, so when you say regular fo folks could afford those, um, in uh, the late 1910s in Iowa, I think maybe it was 1917 or 1918 or 1919, I'm forgetting the year, but in the late 1910s in Iowa, one person in seven own, owned a car. This was more or less the top, I don't, say the to, I don't want to say the top 15% because um, it was mostly one car families, so it was a much larger share of households, but it was the higher end households in Iowa, and this was credited, uh, and the, the person who got credit for this was the Iowa Road Czar, Thomas McDonald, who built road, which, and again, this is the 1910s, we're talking about paving existing trails, um, widening them so that um, a car could go, or maybe two cars could pass each other with some difficulties, um, and he was credited for doing this on a shoestring budget. He just uh, built at very low construction costs because he broke the cartels of the uh, different uh, of the different contractors, he forced them to compete. Uh, this permitted Iowa to build more roads because it built uh, um, because it built roads cheaper, um, and this made him a superstar and made him uh, and made him the national road czar. And then he was a road czar for I think thirty years, um, making him probably the second most important civil servant of the 20th century in the United States behind J. Edgar Hoover. Um, J. Edgar Hoover is, I mean, there have been multiple biographies of Hoover written about how he professionalized the FBI and also turned it into his personal deep state. Uh, McDonald is much more obscure, but he did similar things. Um, the, my uh, citation, by the way, if people are interested about, um, the, about the part of the deep state parts you can read it in Owen Goodfine's 20th Century Sprawl, how he would uh, partner um, with, uh, how he would partner with, uh, I think it was Firestone, the, the uh, tire company, to sponsor an essay contest called uh, 
how uh, good roads help the religious va- how good roads help the religious life of my community. I think it was nineteen thirty. Uh, and uh, yeah, exactly, exactly. Uh, and um, so the so and again in developing countries, it's much more rule of force. One of the things that bothers uh, drivers so much about jitneys is that the jitneys are bigger than their cars. Um, so they try to get the jitneys out of the road, saying that the jitneys just create more traffic, which is of course ridiculous. A jitney. Like, let's call it a Matatu if it's a Nairobi or a Danfo, if it's a Lagos, that carries, what, 30 people? So that creates a lot less than as much traffic as, I mean, the, the, it's people who can't afford cars, so let's say they would carpool, even if it were seven cars. Um, seven cars create more traffic than one jitney, but a person who has an imported Mercedes feels more important than the seven cars that uh, would have working class carpoolers, he cannot feel more important than a, a giant jetney. Um, uh, yeah, a freeborn Englishman, yeah, something, something. Um, the English aristocrats like walking, but they sure don't like people taking trains. Um, there was a lot of nimbyism against early railways by the Toffs. Uh, I think it was a grandson of uh, James Watt, maybe, or a great-grandson who nimbied. Uh, I think it was parts of the Birmingham and Manchester. Uh, there was a lot of active discussion about how awful it would be if uh, more people in England rode trains because then they would not ride, ride horses as much and then there would not be as much of a population of horses. And then if there, if there were fewer horses, then it would reduce the tradition of equestrianism and it would weaken British cavalry. This is an argument actually made, I think, on the t- in, I think in the... Uh, in the Times, uh, on the eve of the railway mania, it's mentioned in uh, it's mentioned in uh, uh, Andrew uh, in Andrew Odlisko's um, in the in the monograph about the railway mania. I think it was the first one. The railway mania, Odlisko. He's am I pronouncing his name? Yeah. So I think it's his first one. Not so. Not this one. The uh, he, he's bit, he's written a bunch of monographs, and this is, I believe, the first one where he mentions this. Uh, and anyway, so um, so the point is that this uh, so we're, so the Jitneys, of course, have their own infrastructure as well because they are the dominant user wherever they are. The cars are still dominant in a place like Lagos, in a place like Nairobi, in a place like uh, uh, in a place like Kampala, just because there aren't that many jitneys. So when there are no jitneys, the car owns the city. But where the jitney exists, the jitney owns. Um, and this actually leads to a lot of tension, I might even say class conflict, um, because the cars don't really like that. Um, this is again in a situation with much more rule of force and rule of law on the road. Um, now if you codify rule of law, sorry, um, or rather, you codify rule of force to turn it into rule of law, then you say things like it's illegal for pedestrians to jaywalk, but there are going to be traffic signals, so there are going to be times in which it is okay for a pedestrian to cross the street even when there is a car. Uh, and you can always cross the street. Um, nowadays, yeah, there are arterial roads that don't really let you do that. Maybe they don't have crosswalks, but again, we're talking in 1920s. Um, at the time, there are no freeways. Um, again, there might be that, there might be the odd motor. Uh, parkway that um, we looked at before in Long Island. There's the Holland Tunnel at this point, but peripheral to what I'm talking about. Um, but so the point is that cars were codified to be the dominant user, um, and this also meant that the bus could never compete because the bus did not have that dominance anymore. Um, maybe it never could have had, uh, but um, but this meant that the bu- but this meant that the bus needed to compete for space with far more users. The bus would always be slower because the bus would make stops on the way. And um, the, and as a result, the bus never had its infrastructure. Streetcars did, of course. Streetcars had the streetcar tracks. The streetcar tracks were also kind of designed in a way that forced other people, partly through norms, partly through design, uh, to, to yield to them. Um, cars would yield to streetcars more than they yielded to buses. Part of it is that the streetcar 
can't as easily slow down for a car, and everyone knows this, um, to the point that this, uh, in places where the streetcars had been eliminated and then restored in the form of a modern light rail, um, people had, the agency had to remind the public of that. So in, uh, in Portland, uh, there was a uh, sign reminding drivers to get out of the streetcar's way. Uh, not the street, I'm not talking about the Portland street, I mean, I'm talking Max Light Rail through the downtown, either through down, the downtown transit mall or um, at crossings um, outside city center, I don't remember. They had um, a dead signs in a, in a public uh, and a public service announcement saying something like, uh, Max light rail weighs 60 tons, you don't. Um, just to make it clear that the train will not get out of your way. It cannot. It's a train. Um, so this is something that light rail has. Um, and as a result, light rail could be a transportation revolution. It's not as big as the train or the car, but it is a thing. I don't think it's been especially successful in Portland, but it has been very successful in other places. Um, not in the United... In the United States, I guess the closest is Seattle. Um, there's in Canada, Calgary, um, where um, it's not really that system, but as in Portland, but with, I think, twice the ridership or something like that. Um, the, twice the ridership on half the metro size or something like that. And... Uh, the um, and, and that's been pretty successful, but again, it required its own infrastructure, which meant things like uh, a uh, de which meant dedicated tracks enforced by the sort of rule of law that had previously told everyone, that it had previously codified the fact that everyone must get out of the way of cars, um, and uh, and and at grade crossings, uh, there would be sometimes there would be crossing gates. Even when they, even when there weren't, uh, there would not be any expectation that the uh, light rail needs to slow down. Uh, how does it compare? Uh, it's not as good. Edmonton, um, Edmonton has had higher construction costs from the start and a smaller system and lower ridership. I think it also doesn't serve city center as well, but I don't remember. Um, and now we're we keep talking about how these modes of transportation also change urban geography to fit their needs better. So how shipping created entirely new cities that would not have been important otherwise to so things like New York or Singapore, um, or to keep talking about cities they've lived in Tel Aviv. Um, the origin story of Tel Aviv is Jaffa. The origin story of Jaffa is the port used to get to Jerusalem. So Jerusalem was the largest city in the southwestern Levant uh, in the late 19th century, but industrialization started from Jaffa, which was where the ships um, dumped people um, coming to migrate. Um, I say coming to migrate, but the Jaffa soap industry, I think, actually slightly predates Zionism. Um, and as a result, uh, so, so partly that, partly I should... It's not just that. Also, part of it is um, agricultural technology. So the reason uh, the green line looks like this, it's in red, but it's called the green line, uh, is that uh, this was the armistice line in 1949. This is the armistice line in 1949 because it was what the IDF managed to conquer, but much of it is actually where there had been Jewish majority. So there, I don't think there was a Jewish majority within the Green Line in 1947, there was a Jewish majority in the area that was designated for the partition plan. The partition plan, I mean, this is essentially start for the partition plan and then have the um, Jews actually win the war. Um, I actually think that if you say UN partition plan, it will give you, it will give you that one and not anything in the other partition. Um, and this is agricultural. So, um, yeah, so you can see, so you can see, so, so the Green Line is something like this. Um, also, it gets to Jerusalem. Um, um, and and uh, Ramle ended up being... Uh, Ramle and, uh, and Lod, Lida, um, were assigned to the Arab state, but were conquered. Um, but uh, the... And, and, and Beresheva, same thing. But the point is that the coastal plain had a Jewish majority, had a large Jewish majority at that point. Um, essentially, it was just agricultural technology. Um... Uh, 
agricultural technology from Europe uh, was good at farming this land, as I, as I understand it. So the so there was a lot of Jewish settlement throughout uh, agricultural settlement throughout this region, um, and uh, um, but again, part of it is just but part of it is transportation. Jaffa was the port that people used to get to Jerusalem. And then Jeff and Tel Aviv combined became bigger than Jerusalem early 20th century. And um, and likewise, Haifa was designated as the main port. Um, uh, subsequently, it never became as big, but it did become near tied with Jerusalem for second largest metro area. Uh, and uh, in the same way that trains did big changes to cities, namely they encouraged a lot of urbanization. Uh, both because of freight and because of passengers. So with pa with freight, the issue, and this is something that, um, and, and I keep giving references because I'm talking a lot about, hist about economic history and it's important to cite sources on this, that it's not going to be a uh, backlit talking head uh, saying things uh, that need to take on faith. This is from Paul Krugman's entire corpus. He mentions that in his Noble lecture, um, I think if you go to his, I don't know if his um, blog on the New York Times is still active, but he linked to some uh, slide presentations um, about the economics behind new trade theory and where he, where he explains that uh, lower uh, shipping costs due to freight rail uh, actually encouraged more urbanization. And the reason they encourage more urbanization, more concentration, is that you think that lower shipping costs... Um, mean that you can put a factory anywhere and ship from it, and that is true, but it also means that you can put the factory in the core and ship to the entire country. Um, and so lower transportation costs actually increase um, centralization. So the United States grows steadily more economically centralized around the manufacturing belt, uh, peaking in the 1910s, um, and then this declines after World War II uh, because of changes partly due to trucking, partly because the uh, federal government drags the South uh, from the Middle Ages into modernity, uh, partly um, because the, of changes in the nature of manufacturing mean that a lot of uh, legacy industries in the North are uncompetitive. It's something that's happened in a lot of countries. For example, in Belgium, uh, the industry used to be in Wallonia, but the legacy industries in Wallonia didn't really work well with the post-war economy, so the new industries are in Flanders. Likewise, in Germany, um, the legacy industries were in Saxony and in the Ruhr. Uh, now, Saxony ended up um, in the east, but they were ended up in the west and still didn't really uh, manage to deal with these changes in, not transportation, but, econo but economic geography, but, uh, not even economic geography, just economics and the, and the nature of production. Um, and so, um, the rising industrial region of Germany is the south, so that would be Baden-Württemberg and uh, Bavaria. Uh, so, but rail so railways didn't create didn't create Bavaria or Baden-Württemberg, but they did create the Ruhr. Uh, they did create um, Yorkshire was actually kind of not very industrial. Uh, I guess West and South Yorkshire were, um, but the the kind of manufacturing complex of the north, so. West Yorkshire, South Yorkshire, and Southern Lancashire. Um, and then Birmingham is kind of different, but still very heavily industrialized. Uh, and so uh, this is something we also do with cars in kind of the opposite direction. Cars are much more capacity limited than trains. Cars don't agglomerate as well as trains, so they encourage de-urbanization, suburbanization of residences. Um, de urbanization of jobs. That's one of the reasons, not the only one, as I said, there, was this, the, there were changes in the nature of the economy that meant that um, the coal mines of northern Appalachia were no longer viable. It meant that um, uh, a lot of the legacy industries in places like Ohio and Michigan uh, were uncompetitive. Uh, the South, again, got dragged out of the Middle Ages in the 1960s. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. In, in, the, in the 1830s, yes, but then they reinforced it. Um, like, there was quite a lot of growth in, like, in, the, in southern Lancashire uh, and around southern Lancashire after 1830 as well. And, uh, and in Beringa.
uh, and um, and so the changes. So, so part of but part of it is that uh, trucks encourage decentralization because you don't need to build one dock or one rail terminal. It's much more viable to spread out, and that encourages the urbanization of job geography. Uh, it encourages uh, lower density, and this is, again, it's one of the factors that uh, led to the uh, rise of, um, uh, of the South in the United States. Again, it's not the only one. There were political, there were economic conditions, but, this is also, but there was also um, the impact of transportation. Um, and again, all of this came with infrastructure, and of course, with trucks, and, the, and we're talking 1950s, 60s, of course, it's the interstates. Um, it's stuff that, again, part of it predates the interstates, but it's also the interstates. The interstates made trucking a viable competitor to railways beforehand. Trucks were just last mile conductors. Railways in the early 20th century in the United States actually liked trucks. This is, I don't actually remember if, uh, where whether I read it in 20, 20th century sprawl or in um, the big roads. Uh, but the early railways in I didn't say early railways, early railways in the nineteenth century. Railways liked early trucks because they figured that the early trucks would extend uh their uh the range of the railheads. Um it's just that with it, it's just that trucks led to oh yeah. Oh yeah. It's just that the trucks um led to changes in production that made rail less efficient at shipping unless you were doing very concentrated things. We're talking unit trains. We're talking um, bulk trains that all come from one coal region, like uh, like the Powder River Basin, or if you're doing um, a lot of intermodal shipping, um, like lots of containers. Um, and otherwise, rail just lost its competitiveness. Um, and to this day, I mean, freight rail is competitive at very long ranges. Um, you want to see where freight rail is dominant? It's at very long ranges. The most important railway globally is the Trans-Siberian, uh, where the competition is never with trucking. Yeah, in, th in theory, you can uh, get, get on a truck um, somewhere in China and then drive it to Russia and then drive from Russia to... Probably you can't drive to Western Europe from Russia right now, but you can certainly drive to Brest. Uh, and, uh, and, might just, and you might still be able to drive from Brest into Poland. Uh, but lol, okay, the, the, the competition for the Trans-Siberian is not that, it's shipping, it's boats. Um, and yeah, exactly, and then, uh, and, and changes, so yeah, changes in warehousing, but also, but again, but so infrastructure at all levels, so this is for manufacturing, but also, of course, just actual transport infrastructure, in this case, freeways, um, you know, freeway interchanges, uh, even truck stops, and um, the so, so and again i'm talking about how some public transportation innovations had this as well like light rail um kind of inheriting the absolute priority that railways get at grade crossings uh or sometimes physically separated infrastructure as with the metro metros have their own infrastructure that infrastructure is called the metro tunnel um that is self-explanatory this is why i'm not going over it too much uh, but that, of course, leads to, like the other modes of transport, big changes in economic geography to accommodate it because urban rail loves concentration. Urban rail hates dispersal. Urban rail works really well when jobs and residences are concentrated. Um, it's not an iron law or anything. There are variations. The most interesting to me is that um, the job uh, density in Australia, in the main cities, is not actually that high. Um, I, I found at some point a uh, number of jobs by region, by um, statistical division of Australia, not as granular as I want, but I think it's I think it's uh, pieces that are maybe one to four square kilometers. So I just added up the ones to make to to get to a hundred because I use a hundred square kilometers because that's what I have in Paris. It's pure data availability issues. Um, and in Paris, those 100 central square kilometers comprising the city and um, the suburbs of La Défense, there are, I think, 37% of Ile-de-France's Ile employment. 
uh, New York, you do 100 square kilometers, let's say most of Manhattan, Long Island City, downtown Brooklyn, the Jersey City waterfront. I don't think you can get to Newark that way. Um, it's about the same, maybe 35%. And these numbers tend to be degressive. Uh, in Sydney, I think it's high teens. Maybe I think in Sydney it's 17 or 18 or 19%. I think Melbourne is maybe the same, Brisbane is lower. And Sydney has almost the same model split as New York. Sydney's transit model split is 27%. New York is 30 to 33, depending on definition of metro area. Um, when I said 35%, I meant the, on the narrow definition. So New York would be 33. Um, Sydney's almost as high. All of this is, by the way, pre coronal numbers. And um, so the correlation, again, is imperfect, but it is very strong between how centralized the job geography is of the city and public transport usage, because public transport means that you can build giant city centers with lots of skyscrapers and no parking. Um, so this means that you can go very high on job density. And in Europe, you don't have these clusters of skyscrapers, but you still have a lot of mid-rises that stretch for many kilometers, many square, many square kilometers on end. Um, the, the job density in the 12th in Paris, the 12th arrondissement where I used to live, is higher than on the Upper East Side, for example. So this is very residential, um, except the hospital, like uh, this is Cornell and this is Mount Sinai. But, um, uh, the, but otherwise it's just residential plus restaurants and supermarkets. And, um, the, and, and I guess Hunter College. But, um, but, but, uh, but in Paris it's more mixed. Um, but, the, but the job density is pretty high. And yeah, there isn't much parking. You don't need parking. You're in Paris, right? Right the metro, right the hotel. So this is how, so this of course also encourages cities to grow bigger. Um, so this means that with public transportation design, and not, I'm not saying public transportation in general, as you, as you mentioned, metro specifically, uh, encourage cities to be bigger because they need a minimum city size to, head, to get a metro. Um, re, the, the reason Riga doesn't have a metro is that it only hit that in the, um, late enough in the Soviet Union's existence that there were plans. The rule in the Soviet Union was you get a million people, you get a metro. Um, Riga hit that. I think in the 1980s, so yeah, they started planning a metro, and then the Soviet Union bit the dust. Um, and in the 1990s, suddenly the situation changed. First of all, there was a lot of emigration out of Latvia, so Riga is no longer as big, and second, suddenly people could get cars because consumer goods became available. Um, and maybe people even associated cars with prosperity by comparison with the United States, I'm not sure. I know this is, it's a big thing in Poland. Poland has way more cars per capita than, for example, Germany. Um, Poland kind of tries to imitate American farms in many ways. Um, not in everything, because um, evidently the US has gay marriage and Poland has gay lynchings. To be clear, the gays are the ones being lynched, not the ones doing the lynchings. Um, but on, on a lot of issues of how they perceive kind of the aesthetics of capitalism, um, not the, again, not the actual usage, not the, not the actual praxis, which is rather European, Poland does not have American inequality, not even close. Um, it's, it's very American that way. And, um, and, and I, I, I think the Baltic states might be the same, I'm not sure. I do know that they had collapses in public transport ridership, that they haven't really been able to recover. Whereas, for example, even in Poland, for example, Warszawa has good public transport ridership. And then in Czechia and Slovakia, the cities have very high tramway ridership. And of course, in Prague, Metro. Um, Oh, hey, Scanning. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, I mean right. So, uh, yeah. So we, if you have a lot of parking, then sure. If you have a very nine to five oriented downtown, but um, how much longer? I mean, Alito is free to give the Democrats more Senate seats if you'd like. Um, um, I don't actually know if Kavanaugh is going to stand for that. Um, Roberts didn't even want to repeal Roe. Um, I imagine that Kavanaugh is someone who actually listens to what Senate Republicans say, so you never know. Um, but, I mean, Roberts obviously does. Um, but anyway, the point is that, uh, so cars created the, create kind of their own cities, but they require this infrastructure. It's just much more invisible, but with metros, it's very visible. 
with white rail it's also uh visible it is less intensive um one of the reasons a lot of um uh, a lot of new left urbanists in germany prefer light rail is that they dislike the aesthetic the, the idea of bigness including big cities never mind that the big cities have the lowest car usage lowest per capita emissions as they keep reminding people in germany the average as of i think last year 2021 was nine tons per capita and berlin was five uh that's what that's your city with not a lot of cars and the um and, and so the upshot is that in so so light rail is something you can do in much smaller cities um Bratislava has a lot of light rail ridership, but no has a lot of light rail ridership. I mean, streetcar, the distinction is kind of meaningless at that scale. Um, I think Salzburg has actually a lot of streetcar ridership. Uh, but again, you, you need dedicated infrastructure. Um, informality no longer works, so this means that the streetcars increasingly need to get their own dedicated lanes, at least in the most congested parts of the city. If they don't, they just slow down to the point that they're unusable. Uh, or you can do it by having some kind of car light city center. Uh, I mean, uh, I think in Basel, in, in Basel, I don't think they get dedicated lanes very much, but there are restrictions on car entry into city center. So in practice, these are dedicated lanes because yeah, the lanes are shared with pedestrians, but pedestrians are not going to create traffic jams for street cars. Um, yeah, yeah. The the issue is also that separately. So this is also not just um, the Soviet Union, but the United States built rather wide roads in the nineteenth century, even in city centers. So there were never these kind of Altstadt areas with a lot of. Uh, production a lot of like uh, a lot of office buildings things like uh, the city of london where you just could not enter in a car that just did not exist in the united states except in what downtown boston maybe maybe lower manhattan i guess um and yeah and so the um and, and in the soviet union same it industrialized under more modernist ideas but had underdeveloped consumer goods until 1991 uh and um but but anyway yeah so the so this is how you need this kind of infrastructure and again with public transport if it's on the surface you need some level of priority and i'm talking about light rail but this is also true of brt um there has been a revolution in buses in which people actually ride buses even when they're not desperately poor um it started in Curitiba. And yeah, Brazil is not a rich country, but Brazil is also not very poor, and Curitiba is one of its richest cities. Um, middle class people in Curitiba sometimes ride the BRT. Uh, the Calvary Lines, what do you mean they don't have dedicated lanes in city center? It's a, um, 7th Street is a transit mall. Um, 7th Street is a transit mall, it's coming. Um, and they, maybe they let cars in off peak or something, but it's a transit mall. Um, same thing with Portland. Um, they have great cross. They have great crossings without absolute priority, um, so they're slower. Yeah, yeah, but uh, yeah, but you, um, it's not just grid. It's also it's also street width. Kyoto is gridded, um, but with Japanese street width. Um, yeah, just the, the, um, the, the yeah, but the transit mall is dedicated, um, at least during the daytime. Like I think Calgary has this trick where they make it easier to use the car in the off hours on the theory that you use the train for nine to five work and then the car for uh, and then the car for um, visiting city center amenities um, after hours. Uh, but but anyway, um, so with BRT. Um, they actually made it work and in the and i mean maybe it only works with the labor costs of brazil and colombia of 10 years ago so now they're um starting to build metros but for a generation it worked it still to a large extent works um and the centerpiece of brt is dedicated lanes dedicated lanes that are completely free of car traffic 
um, not the kind of dedicated lanes of Ashmata that you sometimes see in American or, European, or some European cities where they write bus on the lane and they paint it, but cars constantly violated. There's no physical separation. There are always these um, ifs and buts about how dedicated it is. Um, and of course, you get the, m the more you make the lane a real bus lane, the more bus ridership you're going to get. Um, there's even a term for that. I think it was created by... Um, um, I, I, I think, um, I think it was actually, um, the, the term BRT creep, um, where, yeah, yeah, the Germany, same thing. Germany buried the streetcars. That's one of the reasons the Green Party here hates, um, subways, because they associate that with creating more space, um, on the surface for cars. Um, and then they apply that theory to places like Märkisches Viertel that ne literally never had streetcars. Um, and they say, wait, well, why can't people in Märkisches Viertel just bike everywhere? The answer is because they live kilometers outside the ring. Um, um, yeah, fair. Um, so anyway, the um, so with BRT, you want to avoid BRT creep. BRT creep means that you call it BRT, but don't actually do anything. That's actual BRT. So yeah, maybe you have some dedicated lanes, but they're sidewalk adjacent. Um, cars are gonna are cut through these uh, lanes to park. Cars are gonna double park in them constantly because they don't see buses and the drivers don't respect the buses and the cops don't respect the buses. Um, the um, they're also allowed. They're also used by delivery trucks. Um, maybe they don't. They're not all day. Um, cars are going to turn right across them without dedicated phases. Um, lots of ways you can make BRT not work, or even, or maybe the lanes even disappear where there's the most need for them. That is to say, in the congested city center, high Boston Silver Line. There's a reason activists call you Silver Lie. I've heard Jim Aloisi use the expression silver lie. Jim Aloisi is a big proponent of BRT, unlike me. Um, and um, he was the Secretary of Transportation of Massachusetts, for people who know, he's the political heavyweight of transit matters. Uh, and he, uh, and even he calls the silver line the silver lie, because the silver line has dedicated bus lanes, which are used, which are so unenforced, they're basically the double parking lanes. Um, and uh, then in actual downtown Boston, they don't even exist. Um, and this was called b um, equivalent or better service. Uh, equivalent to or better than the Orange Line, which used to run as an elevated line on uh, Washington Street. Um, they didn't like the L, so they took it down and they realigned the Orange Line in the right of way of the uh, commuter train, the, the main line, the, the, the intercity trains. Um, to Forest Hills, so they actually so this land was cleared here for a freeway, and then they didn't build the freeway, so they used it for other things. Um, so they kept the railway here. It was supposed to the railway was supposed to get zapped and get moved to this line, which at the time did not have all these stations. That Google Earth is saying these stations are from the twenty tens for the most part, um, and so they kept it as commuter rail. They still had more space, so they also put two tracks of the subway. The subway used to run on this street. Boston does not have a grid, so in this area it's actually kind of not very accessible, the orange line, so they built a uh, something that again is called BRT, but is BRT crept to death? Creeped? Crept? Um, I don't actually, I've never actually seen people use the expression to creep with um, BRT creep, so I don't know whether you would, what uh, you would do for the participle. Um, I should ask, the problem is none of the StarCraft people I know on this is a native English speaker, so I can't ask them if you say to, um, if you say, do, do you say the queen uh, has creeped or the queen has crept? I'm not sure. Um, but anyway, this is BRT crept, uh, these this is BRT crept to death. Um, by the way, black people, white people, black people, white people. And yeah, there are people who complain about the racism involved in this, but I mean, Boston is racist as kind of a dog bites man story. Uh, 
And yeah, you could do it. No, no, they absolutely should do this. And there's a reason one of the commenters, the occasional commenters on my blog and much more uh, prolific commenter in other places in Boston is called F Line to Dudley. F Line is because the um, light rail, the subway surface branches in Boston, the, there used to be an A branch up to Watertown, but it was in shared street, so it was removed. And then the others are mostly in, in dedicated lanes or reservations, they're called. So B. Uh, uh, it's on Comav, B, you can C, D actually gets a separated right of way that used to be a railway, E is here, um, here, and it's partly, and it has a short tail that's uh, shared and that's the least reliable part of the system. And so the idea is that the same tunnel, which has a different, a different portal, would they would be extended to go here, and then this would be the F line, um, or maybe here. Um, yeah, they should build that. But again, we're not talking about Boston being racist because again, dog bites man. Um, and um, instead, um, I'm just pointing out how you need the dedicated infrastructure because Boston was unwilling to truly do this for the silver line that's why it's called the silver line in contrast where they had more not entirely no entirely but more dedicated infrastructure on the other half of the silver line which is not connected to this one it's from south to the airport it is more successful um it, it goes i think it's on dedicated sorry i think it was in share tracks through the tunnel but the tunnel is not very congested and then it has i don't actually know if it still does it but it used to have a very the, the loop that it would take from the tunnel here that it would have to the to this tunnel used to be something very circuitous and um, there's a much uh, more direct route um, used by cop cars that I don't actually know if they made permanently available to the buses or only for an emergency um, but the point is that they actually built it here and it's more successful here and um, and this, so this is true of, um, so this is again for uh, uh, BRT. Uh, I have never ridden the A Watertown. Um, and, uh, oh, it was still on the Wacky Loop? Yeah, I think it, okay. Um, so again, I don't know that as well as people uh, at TM do buses. So um, the, um, but anyway, this is also true of other things. So we're talking about buses, we're talking about light rail. Again, with the metro, it's not, you don't even need to talk about this. Um, commuter rail, I mean, again, it's a train, it's on dedicated tracks. I might even point out that the most successful commuter rail systems are ones that give commuter trains some priority. Maybe it's their own tunnel, like the S-Bahn infrastructure in Berlin, in Munich, in, 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 in Zurich, the... Uh, I, I love how I was saying Munich, like it's English, and in Zurich, like I speak German, in, in Berlin, in München, and in Zurich. The RER tunnel, the RER tunnels in Paris. Um, in Stockholm, they actually, the new tunnel dedicated to commuter trains has led to an increase in ridership on commuter rail, but that's maybe just a capacity issue to a large extent. I say to a large extent because they took this opportunity when they built City Bonin, um, they didn't build it just along the same alignment as the old trains, which this is the intercity. So this, so City Bonin is built kind of along this alignment, but it doesn't go like this. Um, it goes like this. So it actually has a stop at Udenplan. These are, I guess, the two exits um, um, at Udenplan. Uh, and I remember, and, and I know this is an exit partly because of how it looks, but also because I lived in this area, actually I remember having seen them build it here. And, uh, uh, and then it goes back. So they're using it for slightly more urban purposes. So we were the uh, second uh, deep mined tunnel station near city center in, a, uh, in, a, in an area that's mostly residential, but it's still um, pretty mixed. There, there's, there's um, Stockholm is a European city center, so very monocentric, um, but very few skyscrapers. Um, there actually more skyscrapers in Shista than in the than in city center. So a lot of so I think Spotify is around here maybe. Um, so a lot of stuff just gets moved. It just moves one or two metro stops um, 
uh, into normal. Uh, there's also stuff. I, I think there's also, there's also stuff uh, on this thing. Like this is a, like uh, Silicon is a big destination. It's just that I think the kind of newer tech jobs um, they tend to be on this side of the side. Um, but um, um, but again, it's partly just capacity, um, as opposed to just commuter rail needs dedicated traffic free of intercity trains. Well, it depends on how reliable the intercity trains are, and ideally they should just be reliable by themselves. Um, people riding between different cities deserve reliability too um rather than deutsche bahn levels of reliability the ones where my train from munich was scheduled to be four and a half hours and it took seven and that was after they already say decided to that it was so late they were going to save the 20 minutes by not um pinching at leipzig and just going direct to Halle. um and so so, so I'm talking about these various modes of alternative urban transport. Oh, that's the the tracks still existed. Huh, I thought they were they had been removed longer than that. Um, yeah, you, I think you can only get to um, Park Street if you want the flying not to share tracks with BCDE. Uh, and yeah, so. Anyway, so let's go on to things that are not motorized because we need to talk about bikes. Because remember that Eric told me this in the context of dockless. Dockless bike share. So we're going to go over bikes and then bike share. So with bikes, um, they do not work without dedicated infrastructure, that is to say bike lanes, because streets are by default owned by cars. If you ban cars, sure, then, this, uh, then the cars are no longer going to own the streets, but cars have not been banned, even in Berlin Mitte. Uh, so bikes require dedicated infrastructure, um, which means a network of bike lanes, cycle paths, cycle tracks, whatever you want to call them. Um, now there is a place that actually does that pretty well. It is called the Netherlands. Um, I want to say, um, famous for, um, having a prime minister who will bury us all, but he's actually leaving because... I think there's some disagreement in the cabinet over how racist they want to be against immigrants, and he couldn't deal with it. He was the more racist one. Um, and um, so, um, in the Netherlands, they have cycle tracks in the cities, between the cities, outside the cities. Um, that's how you can get around by bike. Um, because they expect people to own bikes, um, they have, so separately, they have one of the strongest railway networks in Europe. Strongest is, of course, Switzerland. I think number two in model split or in passenger kilometers per capita or something like that. It's, I think it's near tie between Austria and the Netherlands, and then France is, is um, very likely behind both. Um, Borners, yeah, still in charge until the elections, but I thought that the man would be in charge until the 2040s. So, um, anyway, okay, so Borners, I'm actually curious what Japan is like with bikes, but I will, because in the Netherlands, the issue is, first of all, there are cycle tracks. Um, the second issue is that I need to turn on the light. Actual second issue is um, the Netherlands, because it has bikes at mass scale, and this is different from every other country in Europe where people bike and then take trains. Um, in the Netherlands, they do not they do not want you to bring your bike on the train because the train because the train has too many other cyclists. Um, so what they do is they do bike parking. Um, so in the same way that cars, have, I, I talked about car about cars, which we were talking about a lot about roads, but we must of course also mention parking. Um, there's a reason why um, uh, Donald Shoup has become such a superstar in the livable streets movement, because he centers the issue of parking in the high cost of free parking. Um, and, uh, and the cost of building more parking and the cost of requiring, of mandating new parking, uh, too, much, too much parking for how much people who live in city center condos want to drive, even in places like San Francisco, 
which is not a particularly auto-oriented city by in a, by American standards. It, it's auto-oriented by German standards, but I mean, we're talking about America right now. Um, how do you pronounce it? How do you say Park Street on the... Uh, I'm pretty sure nobody who speaks in that accent actually rides trains in Boston nowadays. Like, it's people who all, all live on the South Shore, and maybe commute 9 to 5 to City Center and then they ride, but um, it's generally the sort of people who think that the trains um, are too dangerous. Um, like, Boston is very... Like, the... The people who threw rocks on school buses in Boston have been replaced by people who are capital and not capital are racist. Please don't ever say racist. It's a divisive term. Um, please don't ever bring up the reproductive worker ants. Um, people don't know what the reproductive worker ant is. Um, that is a reproductive worker ant. Um, and yes, people use that as a circumlocution because they don't want to literally say this. Um, yeah, Boston's weird. I sadly, yeah, need to visit from time to time. But anyway, so cycle tracks get their own dedicated lanes. Um, they also need parking in the same way that cars need parking. This can be public or private. Um, usually street parking is, uh, public. And then there are also parking garages, which are often highly incentivized. They're mostly private. Um... Bike parking, same thing. You need bike parking. So bike parking is not it's not usually extensive infrastructure. Um, you just put a, a piece of metal that people can chain their bikes to if it's a store. But if it's some, it, but if it's a big destination with lots of cyclists, like a tr like a Dutch train station, you need extensive bike parking. So that's also infrastructure required for the bikes. Um, and then you get bike share. Um, Bike share requires docks. It requires cycle infrastructure for the bikes in general. Um, you can do bike share with the quality of bike lanes of, let's say, Berlin, Paris. Of course, Amsterdam much better. In Amsterdam, you probably don't need bike share because you probably just have a bike already. But in Paris, uh, it's the biggest bike share system outside China. Um, and, um, and a lot of these systems are actually profitable through ads. Um, I don't know the finances in Paris. Um, I've talked to Americans um, in bike share, um, and even very small systems, um, like um, Cleveland is a, is a small system that I know better because I talked to Alex Vaca about it a bunch. And, um, and UH Vax, a system in Cleveland, at the time was actually profitable, entirely through ads. The, um, in, in a place like Cleveland, the subscription um, numbers are insignificant. Um, now, I'm not gonna call it a revolution, at the scale of Cleveland or even out of New York, in Paris, I might actually. Um, but again, it required it requires a lot of infrastructure. Um, Dockless was an attempt to do it without infrastructure. Um, it was big in China. I don't know if it still is. Um, it, then they entered. I, I know about it through when it's through when it entered Europe and the United States, and then within a few years they pulled out because they were private companies, riding a bubble, and then they couldn't make money. Um, the, the idea of dockless is that you um, uh, don't ever rebalance, so the bikes are used much less efficiently. But because these are just normal bikes that you have some kind of lock on for people who don't pay, um, they're, they cost so much less than the bikes and the docks that you can make it work, or so they thought. A lot of these companies ended up pulling out of practically all of Europe and the United States. I think Paris was one of... I think a bunch of them said things like we're only staying in like Paris and I don't know what two other Europeans is. I, I'm, I don't actually know what other two. I'm going to make up Barcelona and something, but I don't actually know. Um, I know in Paris they stayed longer than elsewhere just because Paris is Paris. Um, but um, but an attempt to, but my point is that in Europe, in, in at least an attempt to extend an already ongoing revolution in livable streets in that um, the, in, in, in Paris, they appropriated a lot of space away from cars and gave it to pedestrians and cyclists. Um, and, the, and, and in Paris, they, had this, they, they, they still have the largest docked bike share system outside China. Um, I think China, I think Hangzhou and Wuhan are the two main docked ones in China, but my numbers on this are 
eight years out of date and in China eight years out of date is possibly um, too out of date. Um, yeah, yeah, it, it requires trucks to move bikes around. That's part of the, the that's part of the operating cost. Uh, I don't actually know if it's count if Paris has been compared with the entire Netherlands or just with one city in the Netherlands. Obviously, Paris would beat any city in the Netherlands because Amsterdam's small. Um. Oh, okay, okay. In. Oh, okay, okay. So in Japan, you have um, the issue of private bike parking. Yeah, okay, okay. That makes sense. Um, yeah, but off materials, it's one lane mixed traffic, but also it's one lane mixed traffic where the car doesn't go much faster than a bicycle because the straight is very narrow. Um, and the driver, like the average driver, the thing is the average driver does not, the, the average driver is not playing Karma Gavin. Um If the roads are such that the average driver can drive at 50 kilometers an hour without thinking they'll hit someone, they'll drive 50 kilometers an hour. And then the people who are playing Carmageddon are going to drive 50 closer to pedestrians or they're going to drive 60, 70 and they claim that they're in a hurry. Um, but if it's one lane, then the most careful driver sets the speed for everyone else. And because most drivers are not actually complete psychopaths, um, it's much safer that way. Um, so yeah, if it's, if it, so if it's the street width of, um, Tokyo outside the main arterials, yeah. Um, 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 and I will also point out that um, they talk about how dockless didn't really achieve, at least in Europe and the United States, what it was hoping to achieve. Uh, and I'm connecting it to lack of infrastructure. Um, another thing about cycling is vehicular cycling is this movement of, I'm not going to say psychopaths, let's call them masochists or people who probably should be on suicide watch, um, who believe that bikes should be treated like a vehicle, which means they uh, ride in the street as if they are a small, slow car rather than a bicycle. And uh, they are weird and the main of bike advocacy treats them with about the same scorn that transit advocates treat personal rapid transit. PRT, not BRT, PRT. One way, um, one way. Um, these are streets that are sometimes five meters wide. Like these streets are generally single digit meters wide building to building. Um, some of them, and, and, the, and the single digit is often not a high digit. And I'm gonna randomly look at um, random spots in Tokyo and by random spots I'm specifically going to pick the richest part of the city. I mean, richest part of the city is Chiyoda, so richest part that's not very center, so we're going to go in this part. Uh, um, and uh, see what it's like. Um, I think the other than the, for, other than the central theory, I think the richest ward is Shibuya. Um, and then again, it's just stuff west, southwest, like the Yamanoto region. Not the Yamanoto line, the region that it's named after. Yeah, okay. So, yeah. Randomly, the, the, I'm literally just doing some very cursory Google Earth tourism. Yeah, this is about five meters building to building. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you are not, and yes, there are cars that are parked here. I mean, I assume that it's not long term because you require because in Japan you have a proof of parking law. You're required to have an off street parking spot for your car. Maybe this even counts as off street because this is the street, and maybe this is off the street. I'm not sure, but yeah, these are th these are some randomly selected uh, streets in Tokyo. Um, and I'm mentioning Tokyo because I'm going to follow anime conventions in which Japan comprises Tokyo and, um, the, and the pre-modern era, but like, is there any anime that ever takes place in, I don't know, 
Osaka or Sapporo or literally anything urban that's not Tokyo. Yeah, this is not medieval. Um, that's not medieval. What are you talking about? This is like, this is Shibuya. This is all, all this is new. Like this was. Like, I, I don't I don't actually think that this area was developed in the um yeah in the Edo period. We can check, but my understanding is that the um is that the Yamanoto line was at the time it was built was a bypass. Um yeah, maybe there was some village development in um, Shinjuku and Shibuya and Ikubukuro, but not at the scale that several kilometers from Shibuya station it would be actually urbanized. Like the, 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 the Oh, they, they do do uh, anime in Kyoto, like modern Kyoto or um, Kyoto hundreds of years ago? Huh, okay. Yeah, so... Um, so the point is, so I'm dumping on vehicular cycling a little bit just because they thought they could do cycling without dedicated infrastructure, and it turns out you kind of can't. Um, I mean, you can, but don't expect people who don't have a death wish to follow you. Um, it's like, yeah, in theory, you can cycle in Texas. Um, in practice, please write a will beforehand. Um... And so the, uh, and this is also something that's the, the, that should be viewed as true for things that are not urban. And of course, all of these things lead to changes. So I talk about big changes are creating entirely new cities with ships, uh, trains, and cars about um, uh, the contribution of airports to job sprawl, uh, about how metros create these, um, centralized city uh, uh, business districts. Uh, light rail has the same effect, it's just more attenuated and it doesn't require the city to be as big. Um, bikes encourage a kind of very low kurtosis kind of density because b you c bikes do actually get congested if you try to, you, you cannot replace everyone who takes the train into Berlin Mitte with a cyclist. There's not enough room. Cars, of course you can't, but not even bikes. Um, but you can do it in a smaller city. Um, and um, and you can do it if it's a city center that's not very strong. Now, Berlin has a rather low kurtosis city center because it's, I mean, as, as I keep saying, Berlin is a very, is a, Berlin at the scale of, at the metro area scale, Berlin is monocentric as all fuck. Um, you just need to understand that the center stretches from, at this point, from Vashauerstrasse to past the zoo. This is the length we're talking about. Um, stretches more east-west than north-south. Um, and, um, but within that kind of bubble, so like well within the 100 square kilometers they use, Berlin is very strongly centered. It just doesn't have a small city center because it has several. Um, Potsdamer Platz, Alexander Platz, um, Warsaw Straße, the zoo, um, the area around Hauptbahnhof, um, and um, so the so something like this works, but smaller works very well with cycling because you need the density. Because if people cycle for more than a few kilometers, it's too long; they're just going to get cars. Um, and and actually, the, the best place for cycling is often not an entire city there are some dutch exceptions it's the center of a larger city where the bikes get to you go at short range and then everyone else drives or takes uh, drives or uses a train um and um so again so, so again they create they require infrastructure but they also reinforce something about urbanism um and but it's also true at intercity level and this is where we're gonna and when i'm gonna talk about uh, i am sorry Huh. I mean, see, the anime, uh, the thing is that the more, most obscure anime I know doesn't take place anywhere in Japan. It takes place in Italy and Argentina. It's 3,000 Leagues in Search of Mother. 
um, which nobody outside Israel knows because it's from the 70s and uh, uh, and the only people and the only reason people in Israel know it is because it is based on a small part of the novel Heart which was very popular in 1950s Israel the kind of Italian nationalism it was selling was very similar to Zionism and um, as a uh, uh, and as a result people it, so, it, so it was very popular in Hebrew dub in the 1990s there was even a uh, musical and uh, people my age often think that the plot of the novel heart is just this rather than this being based on like two pages in the in the novel um oh apparently it was also very successful in arabic okay i just know it was very popular i mean evidently they even mentioned um israel specifically yep um so anyway, um, so yeah, the, so there's also anime in Japan about cities that are not Tokyo. It's just general. Um, anyway, so the uh, so where was I? Yeah, so, it, so I'm going to conclude by talking about intercity scale because I'm talking about various transportation revolutions. Again, they, these don't have to be as big as the invention of the train or the car, but um, uh, but things. Yeah, isn't uh yeah I, I thought that some of the more recent Pokemon games were not I mean so the first one was supposed to be based on the Kanto region and then they started doing things based on other Japanese regions and then they moved outside the front and sort I think I thought Sword and Shield was technically supposed to be Britain or something. Um, I saw someone play it; it did not feel British. Um, on, on Twitch. Uh, yeah, and so anyway the. Yeah, I mean, I'm not the person who should be following for anime history. This is why Ada Palmer exists. Um, yeah, I mean, it's not just Japanese. I mean, Singapore treats Occidentalism in, in its own very strange way, but yeah. Um, uh, but anyway, so the point is, with inter at intercity scale, the same thing happens, where you can have, where you can have a revolution it requires its own infrastructure and it also changes infrastructure dramatically. So we talked about the impact of the interstates, uh, sorry, we talked about the impact, uh, the impact of the first railways on intercity geography about how they created certain concentrated industrial regions. Um, and again, the north, in, in the north, northern England was already on its way before, but in Germany, the industrialization came later. So the war was much more created by railways and Saxony. Saxony is not thought of as very industrial, but as I keep reminding people, it actually had faster population growth than Prussia um, up until World War II. Um, Prussia, the entire state. So Prussia had much faster growing parts like the Ruhr or Berlin and slower growing parts like Prussia proper, parts that are currently in Poland or Russia. Um, but um, uh, it's just not thought of as industrial because people think of it in terms of an Eastern European industry, like, like a communist industrial history. Um, and then trucks created the uh, job decentralization. So much of the New South, I shouldn't maybe say New South because I think the New South term was a reconstruction and post-reconstruction economic one, but the New South 1960s onward um, was created again, partly by um, lower wages than in the North um, less unionization, so more attractive to employers, partly because they were forcibly brought out of um, the era of racial pogroms, partly because, uh, and, and not just racial pogroms, but also domination by anti-developmental rural interests. Um, the, the South remained dominated by white people, but instead of idle landowners whose, work, whose land was tilled by sharecroppers, it became people who start their own businesses. Um, industrialists, uh, but also partly trucks. And um, so, uh, yeah, no, um, France and Japan, the way France and Japan fetishize each other is very interesting in many ways. And there's a reason that the OA learned from Japan. Um, a lot of learning from Japan, the ground zero for that in Europe is France, which is one of the things that upsets me about Macron because Macron was in a better position than everyone else in Europe to do mandatory quarantines. 
um, in 2020 because um, Japan did not do it as well as the rest of Asia, but he could have likewise learned from Korea, for example, or even from Japan via Korea. Sorry, from Korea via Japan, um, other way around. Um, and also it, very, it fits his ideology very well. He's the person who made vaccines mandatory and he didn't do that. But we're talking about, um, but speaking of importing Japanese innovations into Europe by France, let's talk about high-speed trains right now. High-speed trains, in general, any the post-war revolution in intercity rail has involved extensive, dedicated infrastructure, which usually means high-speed trains, like in Japan and France, most famously, nowadays also China. Um, and by say, maybe I shouldn't say also China when something like two-thirds to three-quarters of world high-speed rail ridership is in China. Um, it's also China, it's like saying, oh yeah, there are various uh, countries in uh, North America. There's Canada, there's Cuba, there is Guatemala, uh, there's Panama, and oh yeah, there's also America. Uh, and um, so the, so, but even, the, even that has an alternative, which is, as I said, I remember that I, when I was kind of doing my list of the best European railway networks, and by and by best I mean most passenger kilometers per capita. Switzerland's by far number one, and then I don't actually think the Netherlands bothers reporting PKM per capita. Um, I believe it's supposed to be the same as Austria, give or take, and then France I think is a close fourth. Um, the point is that number one does not have high speed trains the way you understand them. Number two, if it's Austria, it doesn't either. Number um, if it's the Netherlands. It, if it's the Netherlands, it does, but they're peripheral to the network. They built it in imitation of France, and it's not actually very useful, the um, um, the HSL site. Uh, instead, it's about using existing infrastructure. You say, oh, yeah, so it's a purely operational revolution, right? Well, no. The Swiss system, the Dutch system, the Austrian system, and um, in imitation of all three, I shouldn't say an imitation of all three. The one that generated this, the, the country that went first, and then its system was um, perfected in those three countries, and now it's slowly trying to um, to re-import these refinements. Germany um, extensively use infrastructure in support of operations. The, the Swiss system is a magic triangle of infrastructure, the service plan, or, or if you want, the, the timetable, and rolling stock. Infrastructure is part of the system. Um, Bond 2000 involved building the infrastructure to make sure that the trains would operate based on um, the based on uh, the um, tact, the clock face, the national clock face timetable. Um, there, uh, just read this article for everything that they built. Um, in German, it's much more detailed, uh, and uh, yeah, something they, they built infrastructure smartly. They did things like double deckers on intercity trains uh, to uh, increase capacity without lengthening platforms. But it doesn't mean that they didn't build infrastructure. They built extensive infrastructure. They built um, so look at all the travel time reductions that they're talking about. Um, they built a um, they, they they built a 200 kilometer line, this one, for this cost. Um, Switzerland, yeah, is very rich and can afford this, but Switzerland is a small country. I mean, you, you bump this cost up for France, and this is what? 12, that, that would be 12 billion, right? Uh, Switzerland is 8 million people, or 8 point something, and France is, I think, 65. So, no, I'm 8, but if you bump it up to French population, it's like 13 billion. Um, Euro is maybe a bit more than a franc, so maybe a bit less than 13 billion euros, like 10 billion. The, this cost, the the, the LGVC dust cost less than that, a lot less than that. Um, um, and look at, so they're, they're mentioning all those projects and their costs. They spent a lot of money on this. They spent a lot of money on infrastructure, infrastructure designed in support of this integrated medium speed system. Um, so there very much is dedicated infrastructure to this and this is without even looking at the uh at the um base tunnels through the alps which are partly for I shouldn't say partly 
most of the trains that go through them are freight trains. Um, and they keep doing this, by the way. So you have all these, I don't even, uh, this is two, three, a bit more than four billion francs. Then they're going to, then they want to ballot um, on even more, I think on either 12 or 21. I don't remember which one they, they picked. But we're talking very large amounts of money spent on infrastructure, on physical infrastructure in support of this intercity system. Um, yeah, and, and in Switzerland they have very high fares if you don't have the um, if you don't have the um, half price ticket. Uh, the, it, it's kind of so when, whenever I look at the ticket prices in Switzerland, they look pretty reasonable to me, and then I remember that you need to pay for the half price ticket for them, and if you don't, you pay twice as much as everyone else. Uh, which is always and uh, which is always exciting, saying that Switzerland stiffs tourists uh, in, in ways that usually I associate with Parisian tourist traps. Uh, oh, because it's a site. Yeah, I mean, I overpronounce foreign. I I, I overpronounce foreign languages, except for. Tones because I know I'll never get them right. Also, high shadow. Yeah, and so the um, and so even in Switzerland they do this very tight integration with infrastructure, and again that's the less common system. The more the more common kind of revolutionary intercity rail system is high speed rail, where yeah you just plop a three hundred kilometer an hour if it's China three hundred eighty kilometer an hour track between just outside one city and just outside the other city. Um, so even intercity and, and intercity. Likewise, has had a large effect on urban geography. It shrinks the country, but it shrinks the country in the direction only in the direction of the line, uh, and not uh, orthogonally to the line. This in both France and Japan uh, has reinforced the dominance of the capital. Um, now, Japan is a rather has a rather linear population distribution anyway. But even there, um, in the same way that I remember how I talked before about how the uh, improve how, and you can see this in Krugman. Krugman actually explains the model in his noble lecture and in um, material that he provided for it. So it's not me just ad libbing um, about how lower transportation costs in the 19th century led to more manufacturing concentration because you could use trains to ship to the rest of the in the United States country. Uh, high speed trains kind of have the same effect because it means that you can put your head office in Tokyo. Or in Paris, and it's much easier to do office meetings in Tokyo or in Paris, um, uh, and, and rather than have uh, branch offices all over the country. Um, yeah, yeah. If it's a yeah, yeah. The the group travel issue is always really annoying. It's especially bad for family travel um, because. Family trips are almost always by car. Um, it's actually really uncommon to do family trips not by car. And I don't know if I've vid if I've vlogged about this, and if I haven't, I should um, uh, about group travel and family travel. And um, because usually with families, practically always one of the parents will have a car, and then they can just drive the car. And four people in a car is rather efficient. Like the uh, um, four people in a car. If the, if the car is not some giant American SUV, then the mass of the vehicle per person inside is going to be substantially less than the mass of a train per passenger in most cases. Um, you're still not that fuel efficient because tires and because it's a small vehicle, but you're actually getting to decent levels of, to do to decent levels of fuel efficiency that like maybe overlap with the worst trains. Um, and um, uh, and you can speak louder um, as, as a family, and so it's so so. This is actually a niche that trains are not very good at. Um, so maybe one of the things that trains do is they encourage more individual travel and less family. I'm not sure. Ooh, I haven't. Okay, well, I should do that. But um, the um, but that that is a, that that is a real issue, and. Um, sometimes you can have group discounts, but that's not the only thing that matters. That matters. Um, and anyway, so the 
Um, so, so back to the, to the connector infrastructure, one of the things, so one of the things that high-speed trains, not, not that I'm talking about things that invo involving job geography, just because high-speed trains are used for leisure, but I guess partly because of the issue of um, group versus individual travel, they're much more useful by individuals than by groups or families. So um, the profile of the user is more, it's not, I don't think it's, entirely it's certainly not entirely business unless you're charging unless you're talis or eurostar and you're charging horrifically high fares for everyone um but um you are usually but but it's it's more tilted toward individual business travel than let's say car trips so they maybe haven't had a big impact on uh the geography of tourism very much uh but I, I actually can't think of any big tourism destination that's really marketed as uh, you can get there by train unless it happens to be a city that also gets a lot of non-tourism travel. I'm thinking about Prague right now, but Munich, um, the um, Köln, Paris, things like that. I mean, yes, Paris is a giant tourist destination. Paris is also a giant non-tourist destination. Um, like, there's actually a lot of productive economy in in france i mean it's easy to market from germany but there's a lot of there's a productive french economy um it's very paracentric um um i have no idea i will tell you that in both france and germany i think also in britain intercity travel is above pre corona levels at this point um yeah it's hard to compete with when you don't have to wear pants but um the but evidently ridership on intercity trains in germany is above pre corona levels and this is despite the fact that um they're this is despite the fact that the competition that is to say regional trains which don't count in deutsche bahn fanfacker statistics are free at this point um in britain i know that rail travel in general overtook pre corona levels um, when crossrail opened um i don't know if intercity is also overtaken i don't know um, but intercity in both France and Germany is above pre corona levels. By the way, in Spain, in, in, in I believe both Madrid and Barcelona have overtaken pre corona levels even for local rail travel. Um, like there, there is recovery, and this is even in Spain where the uh, where you basically were not allowed to leave your apartment um, for a couple months um, because it was that, or literally the entire country would die. I mean, not literally, but you know what I mean. Um, and uh, the uh, but but um, but what they do, and again, Spain is actually another good example of this, where the high speed trains reinforce the dominance of the capital because it's much easier to get to the capital than to get between two different places. Um, in France, if you're a driver, it's easy to get between I don't know Lyon and I don't want to say Vichy, but I don't mean Vichy qua. Vichy, uh, Vichy France. Uh, um, I mean, qua, Vichy qua, the, um, the, the resort town that became the head of the collaborationist government because as an elite, as a place of elite leisure, um, it had a typical uh, infrastructure development for elite use. I think it was the, I think Vichy and Paris were the only French cities with, I'm forgetting what, like some kind of telegraph connection or something that encouraged this to be the center of government in not Lyon. Um, so if you're going to do that, that's very easy by car, by train, forget about it. Um, or if you're going between, so, or if you're going up mountains or if you're going even between cities, let's say you're going between Lyon or, Mar or Marseille and Toulouse or Bordeaux, the, by car, you go this way, by train, you don't go this way because these trains suck. By train, you go via Paris. So it again, reinforces the dominance of the capital. Um, and again, this doesn't sit right with a lot of new left urbanists especially in germany where people mock france i think more than is warranted um and don't know that japan exists uh and if they did they would mock it more um and uh so but but it, it is an effect that trains have on uh urban geography and and, and even something that's more that's less capital dominated like the swiss network or the network germany has or the network germany builds is a network that's still very urban it's uh the 
Um, so now there's reasonably fast, I shouldn't say fast, but reasonably fast range between here and Minchin. It means, yeah, I can visit Minchin. It means that there's more dominance over time that's gonna happen out of, on, out of the cities on the network. So there will be Berlin, Nuremberg, Minchin, Eventually, um, I think also Leipzig to some extent, just because it's close. But through, there are already through trains that escape Leipzig. There are planned to be there's plan, the plan is that there's going to be an hourly train that doesn't even stop at Leipzig. And of course, the city is on the way, so this could be Halle and Erfurt. Um, also, end up benefiting. It's just being on the way. But the main effect would be reinforcing the role of Berlin, Hannover, um, the various rhine ruhr cities, Frankfurt, Nuremberg, München, Stuttgart, Mannheim. Um, and again, it's the, and this is, but this is something that again involves infrastructure. It can involve infrastructure for timed connections at 200 kilometers an hour. It can involve infrastructure for 300 kilometers an hour. Ideally, you should do both. Um, it's not actually that expensive, and and usually for a very, if you maxed out on one of them, usually the other is where your lowest hanging fruits are. So in France, it would be the lowest hanging fruit in France is to just improve the regional trains to connect to intercities better. And also to themselves. In Germany, the lower hanging, for, the lowest hanging fruits are just build three hundred kilometer an hour trains. But again, it requires infrastructure. It's something where thinking about intercity rail growth. Reminder: Deutsche Bahn is planning on doubling intercity traffic from two thousand nineteen to the mid twenty thirties. Um, judging by recent trends, it, it is actually plausible that it will happen. There is growth in rail traffic. Uh, there was growth before Corona. There was a dip during Corona, and now it's back. Uh, yeah, New York. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the United States has not recovered as well as Europe. Uh, yeah, but work from home separately means more car travel. Remember, car travel dipped very briefly and then surpassed pre Corona levels very quickly. Uh, Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Definitely. The wait. Wait. I thought in the the yeah, well, I thought the issue in the mid nineties is that peak was. I thought the issue was that peak basically didn't change between the nineteen eighties and twenty nineteen, and it was actually below nineteen sixties seventies level, and then the entire change in the nineties was giant rise in North Bay. Um. I want to say universities in Florida are kind of a meme, but I'm thinking about just the one. Um, but um, but anyway, so this is something where you do need the infrastructure to do intercity rail. Um, and in Europe, it means things like actually completing the network in Germany. It means actually building things between countries, not just within them, um, in which essentially every country sucks um, at this. Um, it's like Germany and France keep saying to each other, you suck, and they're both correct on this. Um, and the, um, but again, it's, it needs to involve extensive infrastructure. It's not just something that you can say, oh, run more trains on existing infrastructure. That's like saying, oh, just run more buses. You don't need BRT, or you don't need dedicated lanes, or why don't you um, bike on, uh, on the roads that already exist, and then roads that already exist are these you know, eight-lane or six lane monstrosities where cars go 70, 80 kilometers an hour. And, um, and they say six lanes, but it's not like the, like a lane is, is about three ish meters. I'm not saying it's six lanes and then the um, sidewalk and in buildings. So that's, it's like a New York, like a slightly narrow, the na narrower than average New York Avenue. No, I think extended then maybe there's a little striped parking. And so the cars, don't ever run into anything. So the, so building to building, we're talking 40, 45 meters. And then you tell people, oh, you can just cycle on that street. Um, enjoy being doored. Um, that's kind of the, the issue that, that I think is why dockless didn't succeed here. And also why I don't think service only, rather than service and infrastructure, rail reform could succeed here or in the United States. Um, work from home. Uh, WFH is work from home. Yeah, that, that's um, yeah, that's that, that's something plausible. It's actually a very European thing, um, also because in Europe, city centers, and I think actually Japan is like this. I mean, so, so as I mentioned before, I mean, in, um, I I don't have a reference on this right now. And I'm sorry, but if you 
I, I, I kept Googling a couple of years ago for um, income in uh, Japan, I think by prefecture and then in Tokyo by ward and the, the richest ward. Um, oh, oh, yeah. Um, the richest ward is Chiyoda. I think it goes Chiyoda. Then I don't remember the Chuan Minato order. Um, and then it's, um, and then it's Shibuya. Um, so very so yeah, there's a little bit of directionality in that Yamanote is richer than um, Shitamachi, but uh, but also center is richer than periphery. Um, Japanese people that I would talk to um, in in, uh, in various places like in New York where I would constantly make fun of Jersey, I would ask him, oh, is there a Jersey of Tokyo? And they say, oh yeah, people mock uh, Chiba and Saitama is what I was told. Um, so again, far away and also kind of. Far, um, and also kind of in the Shitamachi direction. Which university is a meme? Uh, New College. Uh, the one where uh, they, uh, um, about the one where they're going full Orban. Full, full Victor Orban on the uni. And, uh, no, you, uh, no, no, you, uh, no, like the flagships. I can, you can kind of, kind of call, call them a meme and that the, is that uh, the flagships in Florida are still not as good as let's say in Georgia. Like there's nothing in Florida that's like, UGA or Georgia Tech or um, UNC or U Texas, um, to Texas Austin, I mean. Um, but also, no, when I said meme, I, mean, I specifically meant no college. Um, and um, so, anyway, the uh, uh, so the point is that in Europe, and again, I think Japan is the same. There's a lot of residential desirability around city center. So the city center is not purely commercial ever. Again, in Tokyo, it's maybe a little different because you do have things like... Um, in Tokyo, I know that places like... I don't think anyone actually lives in Hibiya or in Moronouchi. Um, but people, but rich people absolutely do live in, 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 uh, in, in Roppongi. And of course, Roppongi... Oh, okay, okay, okay. Because it, but, 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 in, uh, but for example, Roppongi um, is... Uh, a very swank residential area. Uh, so Roppongi specifically, things where the rich foreigners live. Um, and then I'm forgetting the areas nearby where rich native Japanese live. Is it, is it, uh, is it Nazabu? Um, but the point is that this also attracts a lot of um, high-end businesses. So for example, Google Japan or Google Tokyo is in, is in Roppongi. And there's a lot, a lot of uh, commercial commercialization there. So it's very mixed, and again, it's, it's rather European in, the, in Paris too. I mean, the, um, uh, the, there are places with actually very low residential density um, in the in the pure commercial part from the opera or something. But no, the, the but the actual residential density even in the second, um, the second being the arrondissement with the highest job density, it's not that low. I mean, it's maybe a little bit below city average. That's it. Um, and um, same with the eighth and the ninth. The first has a very low residential density, but look at the first. This is in the first. So yeah, if a giant part of the arrondissement is taken over by parks, yeah, that's gonna lead to lower residential density. Yeah, sure. Um, but um, the, uh, the, I think the first, I don't remember the exact boundaries, I think, all of this is first, and then this is fourth. And then I think this is the boundary between first and second. So second, I think, would be this, maybe. I think the boundary goes like this, maybe. So yeah, no shit, the first is low residential density, but that's partly part. It's not that it's a single-use business district. It really isn't. Um, but and this is despite the fact that, as I said, Paris is a very strongly centered city. It's just not a few square kilometers in the business district like in America. Oh yeah, exactly, yeah. Um, yeah, um, in, in general, by the way, unless you're extremely familiar with Japan, you will not get to the socioeconomic cues. Um, socioeconomic cues are very particular to a culture, which means that, for example, Americans do not notice them in Europe in general. Um, because Americans, for example, rely on race a lot for socioeconomic cues. Um, because in a place like New York, there's basically no intact white working class except very far out. So you rely on socially on socioeconomic cues. Like if you see a lot of black people, then maybe that's a poor area. 
And then you go to a place like Berlin and there are just no black people or very few black people. Um, and um, the and so the queues get really messed up. And this is where you get Americans go all wide eyed when they visit Europe and they don't know because they don't notice all those socioeconomic cues. Um, and, and, I, and I emphasize race because I say this because when I just landed in New York, I visited Bedside for some event and nothing there registered as poor to me because I, I mean, I was practically fresh up anything. And I, I think I went there two weeks after moving to New York. Yes, of course, I would not perceive bodegas that say deli grocery and gourmet and um, basketball court where black people were um, playing were, were playing hoops and uh, modernist housing projects as poverty because they weren't anywhere else like that. Um, yeah, sure, but even in places that do have high residential segregation, um, people don't usually notice the, the cues um, or they notice the wrong things. Like Paris, for example, has higher levels of segregation. Um, not high, but Paris is more segregated than London. Um, I think more segregated than Berlin. Less so than New York, but because Paris actually does have a lot of black people um, and, and a lot of um, uh, Arabs, um, Americans go there and get really confused. Um, so either they, they realize, oh, there's integration in the sense that black and white people go to the same restaurants at the same time, which is not generally a thing in, let's say, New York or Washington. Um, or they uh, just see black people in shit bricks if they're more racist. Like there, there's a, there are many, uh, there are many examples of um, Charles Murray being a dumbass. One of them is that he, is that he was in Europe and uh, he was apparently was visiting Paris and and was really uncomfortable seeing black people there and said, where, where are there all the real French people or something like that? Um, and, um, and, and also neither Japanese nor continental European class systems are very well known outside their respective countries. The British one actually is. So in Britain, so people, so because people who study ESL do learn, do, like do read like pantomimes of like actual Victorian literature, maybe they, or they read actual Victorian literature, like they learn about the British class system. They learn about things like Cockney accent, even if they think that Mary Poppins is an example of a real Cockney accent and not the best example of bad Cockney. Um, so this is something that, so, so the British class system, I think it may be more understandable to outsiders just because of English media domination, but the French one, the German one, the Japanese ones are just not very well known. You would think that run down buildings and graffiti would be more universal accused to poverty. Um, sure. We have run down buildings and graffiti on my street. Um, my street is not poor, thank you very much. I live in a, um, I live in a recent con in, in a market rate condo in Meta. Um, like the market rate condos here have graffiti tags. Um, because graffiti is in Berlin, a cue for left wing politics. Um, so yeah, there's graffiti that says a camp. There's graffiti that says free Palestine. There's graffiti that says thing. Uh, there's graffiti that says fuck Putin. Um, there's, gra there's graffiti that says feminism that's, that was visible um, from the uh, train uh, in Neukölln, where when I lived in Neukölln. Um, there were, and when I lived in Neukölln, there was also graffiti that says Corona für AfD, which was very nice. This was, no, this was the poorest neighborhood. No, Neukölln is either the poorest or the second neighbor or the second poorest neighborhood in the ring. It, the other candidate is Mabit. But, uh, but it's something that you also see in very middle class um, parts of the city. Uh, but anyway, uh, yeah, yeah. But so anyway, I, I um, so yeah, that's not really necessarily a matter of transportation creating interest, it's just something that's much more about social issues. As I keep talking about, as I keep saying when I talk about how the South became more industrialized and they give trucks as one of the explanation and the infrastructure that was involved is one of the explanations just because the states were the states in the north were rich enough to build turnpikes in the in the case of Pennsylvania even a little bit before American entry into World War II and in the rest right after um, the, the New York threw away the Massachusetts turnpike and so on 
Um, there is very, very little of that in the South. Um, this is because the states don't have money, and so the feds paid 90% of the cost. Uh, but also other things. So, in, so this is where you ta I'm talking about changes in the nature of, um, of, of industrialization that made the kind of old style industries of, um, of what is now called the Rust Belt not less competitive. And again, the South no longer being an apartheid state helps a lot. Um, uh, yeah. Um, so anyway, this is why I'm talking about how it's really important to have uh, infrastructure when you're building transportation. It's like, you, there's really no alternative to this. You can't, I mean, if you wanted transportation to be successful at scale, even it's, if it's something that you think of as not mega project -y at all, like cycling, there is extensive infrastructure for that in the Netherlands. It's taken decades to build. It's not something you do in a day. Um, maybe if you're, if you have some places that are very successful and they're widely recognized as places to be imitated, then you can imitate them very quickly in the same way that if you have one successful high-speed line, everyone will want them as well. So maybe the development of the Shinkansen in Japan was rapid in the 70s and 80s, but it took a while to get there. It took a while to get there with the first line. Um, and the, and like was in France with the TGV development, with the LGV development of the 90s and the 2000s, or, um, uh, or, or rapid growth in metro construction maybe. Um, um, past the beginning, and the same is true of cycling. It's, it, it takes a while and requires a lot of infrastructure. Um, again, things like bike parking, things like much more, much better cycle lanes than you think of even in Germany or Denmark, uh, let alone the United States. And uh, um, and the same is true of intercity trains or, or, or surface transit. You, you do need a lot of that infrastructure. Um, and even if it's even if it's not flashy high speed trains, even if the stuff that Switzerland did for um, for Bound 2000. Um, and I kind of want to stop here, but I am okay staying on camera for like, I don't know, three ish more minutes. We can make it to two, two hours stand recording and take questions. Um, and meanwhile, I'm going to uh, drink water because this bottle wasn't even full when I started. Thanks. Ciao, ciao. Um, I'm upload. By the way, I upload these videos on uh, YouTube just often, severely behind schedule. Oh God. We'll try. Okay. No promises, but we'll try. Um, and yeah, you're right. We should talk about split trains. Probably blog. It's not. I don't think it's a full blog. Um, anything else, by the way? Um, ah. Uh, just building gateway, electrifying everything. Yeah, um, just building gateway, for context, the current projected cost for the tunnel is about $14 billion. So um, just building gateway, it's like saying you don't need a lot of uh, um, changes to um, for, for Ukraine to defeat Russia. You just need to send them 600 tanks and, uh, you know, I don't know, probably a few hundred. Um, F-16s, um, but not nothing very big. Only a couple division. Um, I mean, you have lousy cost, but if you didn't have lousy cost, then um, you would still be spending. New York would still be spending several tens of billions of dollars. They would just not build one tunnel; they would build five. 
Hmm. But anyway, thank you, and I will see you again in the next one. We either in four days or in a week or in eleven days. So anyway, so ciao. ciao.